Welcome to Lessons That Last, where a researcher and a teacher talk about what it means to make a lasting impact on students' lives. They unpack the stories former students shared about their memorable teachers and discuss how we can all make a greater impact on the people in our lives. Here's Julie and Laura. Hello, and welcome back to the Lessons That Last podcast. I'm Julie Hassan, professor, researcher, author, you know all the things, and with me is my lovely co-host, Laura Estes Swilly, English teacher, writer, and really happy to be here. So you picked this story this week, and since you picked it, I have been thinking about PE class. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, sorry. (laughs) Never my favorite class. Um, How about you? Do you remember? I know we were of the junior high era so junior high for we were sixth grade seventh grade and then junior high for us was eighth and ninth and then high school 10th 11th 12th Mm -hmm. and i'm not sure we had to take pe in high school well so ninth grade still was your freshman year your first year of high school they just had us on a separate campus at a junior high, which is, I think, why they eventually made that change. We need ninth graders to feel like they're in high school because this year counts. Right. And so if we put them in the, the big building with all the kids who know everything counts, they'll be better. Um, but that's the hope anyway. That's the hope. <laughs> uh, so I, I did not take PE once we got to high school. Um, PE was a burden to me. Mm. So I was really grateful that once I got there, I didn't have to do it again. Um, But I I have some very distinct memories of my time in PE at public school, because remember, eighth grade was my first year in public school, right? Private school PE was very different than public school PE. Um, And so it was a it was an experience for me, like with a locker and changing my clothes and standing on a number and all the things were and then like the expectations and the the coach the coach personality is not something I was aware of until I got <laughs> to middle school. <laughs> In the uniform, like, and sometimes on Friday, I would forget to take mine home. And then you oh. put on this stinky uniform on Monday. Yes. I do remember that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know what else I remember about junior high PE was there was a soda machine in the locker room and people would finish PE and get a mellow yellow. And even then, I think it occurred to me that after, you know, working out and talking about physical fitness, perhaps a can of lots of sugar and tons of caffeine is not the best option. (laughs) That's true. And, you know, now they've changed PE to the, in, in Florida, we call it hope with the, which is, I think, healthy options through physical fit, physical education. And so they spend like two days a week in a classroom and that's where they take their health class. So health class and PE have joined. And I feel like that's what was missing from our PE experience. We went in the locker room, we changed the, the female coaches were in their offices watching, just make sure nobody was fighting. We went out, we stood on the number, we did a run, we did a ball thing with a ball, we climbed a rope, I don't know what we did. Um, and then we went back, changed again. No one talked about health or healthy options oh. and what went along with the physical education that we were doing. I was running because I was told to run. I was playing kickball because I was put on a team and now I have to kick a ball. Nobody talked to us about why we were doing these things or the physiological purpose for doing it this way rather than that way and how our muscles were working or any of that. And I think I probably could have used some of that information. Well, certainly, you know, all of us grabbing a mellow yellow after working (laughs) out is not the best. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, they needed, the school needed money, Julie. So (laughs) you got to get it where you can. And I'm saying, you know, back then, 84, maybe 83, 84, Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure we knew as much about what was healthy. (laughs) 
Really? I'm, I'm certain we knew Mellow Yellow was not. Yeah. But I don't think the advice we got was even from class was always solid. I, I, I just, I don't know. Call me naive, but I feel like they knew it just wasn't in their curriculum to teach it to us because there were college athletics and professional athletics and there were trainers and there was, there was physical education science was happening. What made Joe Namath, Joe Namath, they were looking at that. Um, I don't know who else was an athlete at that time. I've got to be honest, but there was that information was out there. It just wasn't funneling down to the middle school. Um, Probably through no fault of our teachers. I got to be honest. No. And it, you're right. It wasn't in their curriculum. I think when I remember learning about nutrition, was in home economics. Yes. We, we did right. the food pyramid. Now we know now that the food pyramid was was not necessarily the most solid nutrition. It's a little off plan. <laughs> <laughs> and all the low fat stuff that turned out to be really high in sugar. Yes. Yes. Not but but in the eighties there were things that like through through science and research wasn't widely known yet. Right. I remember in the 90s, early 90s, my cousin who had just become a nurse saying, I was, I don't know, I was eating something low fat. And she said, well, if it's low fat, it's high sugar. And if it's low sugar, it's high fat, just so you know. And I was like, what? And then I started reading labels more Mm -hmm. um, diligently. But that that was the first I'd heard of it. And she probably did a lot of that in her nursing education and understanding food and how diet affects different, you know, ailments and the body, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I got all the way through many, many years before I heard that for the first time. Oh yeah. I think in, uh, I, my PE memories are really strong in elementary school. Oh, because yeah. I had Tony Saladino. He was my oh. PE teacher. And anyone in Hillsboro knows he's a legend. Um, yes. Tony Saladino. Every kid who went to Sevener Elementary is forever in love with Coach Saladino. Mm-hmm. And every baseball player in Hillsboro yes. County, Florida knows Tony Saladino. And I have really clear memories of PE at Sevener Elementary out on the field and on the court with him. And he had a certain routine. And one of the things we did was you get out and again, you get on your number. So that wasn't new for me. He would play this record. He had a record player and this long extension cord and it was the chicken fat record. And it was some man. And I, I need to find it. I'm certain it's on YouTube or somewhere out on the the web. And this man with this very theatrical voice and this kind of orchestra instrumentation and he would sing the exercises for you to do and it would be like now the jumping jacks and the bicycle <laughs> That's awesome. and I, I know if I heard the chicken fat song it would take me right back to the court at Sevener Elementary and Tony Saladino so that's lovely. I remember all the things we did the presidential fitness test where you had to take the yes the Board eraser. Yes. And the shuttle run, we had to take the chalkboard eraser from one side to the next and back and forth. And I was never great at that, but I was never the worst at that. So no, that's because I wasn't at Sethner Elementary with you. Um, but I remember <laughs> elementary uh, and late, yeah, elementary PE at my private school, which is called Maddox, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, and I know this is going to shock you, but there was a time where I would look forward to PE. I was one of the top three fastest runners. I was all in on playing the volleyball or the soccer or the kick, whatever we were doing, I was in it to win it. And, and that was like fourth, fifth grade, probably right before you came to Maddox. Yeah. Um, so older, not a little one, but I was, I was in it and I, I don't know what happened to like, I don't know that was I not encouraged? Was it yeah. not cool to be the only girl and be like in the top five of the pack? I'm not sure, but I was, I had some level of physical fitness. It didn't matter. I didn't know why I just was competitive and I liked to win. 
that's interesting. And I do wonder how much as girls move into preteen years, gender expectations and gender yeah. stereotypes and the pressure to be a pretty girl and the kind of girl that's pleasing yeah. takes some of that, at least back then, and I hope it's different now, take some of that competitiveness and drive and physical activity and changes it into worrying about what we look like and what people think and all of that. And messing up your hair because you got too sweaty or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And not wanting to look funny or mm -hmm. draw any attention in that way. Right. Although we had some really athletic girls in our junior high and high school. Um, yeah, we did. We did. Colleen Gallimore, Jackie Eisenhower. I, I could name so many of them who were such great athletes. And somehow I'm so glad they overcame some of that gender mm -hmm. stereotype. It's true. It's true. But still, I wonder were they getting the information that we really needed about physical fitness and health, which is in some ways so much about what our story today um, touches on is, is Venus's realizations of those things um, in high school. And so if it was her realization in high school, she wasn't being taught it earlier, just mm -hmm. like we weren't taught. And so maybe if we had stayed in PE, I don't know if we'd have gone to the 10th grade PE or the 11th grade, I'm maybe we'd have gotten more. Thinking about our high school PE offerings and who was doing that instruction. <laughs> I think we might have say no. I would say no in PE. I'm thinking we would have gotten more of that in some of the health classes. Yes. Um, yeah. And then, you know, I took food and nutrition again in high school in the home ec department because I took all the home ec. Um, and I think I had Nancy Kahn, who's an amazing teacher. And I remember oh, yeah. learning nutrition things from Nancy, not necessarily fitness. Right. That wasn't Nancy's bag. <laughs> but, no. <laughs> But I do remember learning about nutrition, um, and she she was great at teaching that. And as I recall, she owned a Subway sandwich shop, so she had a lot of information about labels. She did. <laughs> she did, and I think they even opened more than one in the end. I don't know. What I just noticed when I have like a, a pulled muscle or a strained whatever or a little something tugging or nagging at me, if I mention it to Jason, he knows exactly what it is and how I should stretch to get rid of it. And I think he learned that because he was a varsity football player right. and they learned about their bodies, mm -hmm. but we didn't really do that. Yeah. It's true. I guess if you're in a sport that's super prone to injury, you learn how to try to prevent it and what to right. do when it happens. Right. Exactly. I was not in a sport prone to injury, although I did get a really bad strain hamstring once on the dance. Oh, yes, yes, it's dangerous. <laughs> I actually, <laughs> the high kicks will get you sometimes <laughs> if you're yes. not stretched out. If they're high enough. Um, I just had a, a student, um, one of my baseball players who is very athletic. He's a, like just a tremendous athlete. He, we were doing an activity this past week where they had to move. Um, if you agreed with a statement, you had to go to one side of the room. If you disagreed, you had to go to another. So here last week we were talking about building community and here's another way that, that we do it. And then we would talk about it. Can you talk the agrees into disagreeing or the disagrees into agreeing? And then they would move. And so it was like an open dialogue, which was lovely. So this student, um, sort of leaned on a desk and his lean caused every screw in the desktop to fall out no. and the desktop flew and he did the weirdest slow motion fall into the desk and and he was fine he scratched his arm um but I said to him, I watched you because I was on the other side of the room. I couldn't get to him to help him. What was I going to do to help him? I watched you fall. And it was such a slow motion fall that I knew you were trying to correct. Like I knew he was trying to hold himself up. And I said, I think if you were not the athlete you are, you might have been hurt. 
because he fell into a desk, right? And then several hands were on him picking him up and, and he was good to go. And I, but I did send him to the nurse because I was worried about that scratch because it came from metal, right? Not right. the cleanest uh, underbelly of a desk. So I'm pretty sure his athletic training showed him how to fall properly, how to not make it an injury that's going to hurt himself. Like I probably would have twisted 17 ways and needed an ambulance, whereas he just sort of gently went down. Um, it was interesting. And I really attributed that to his athletic training. Yeah, probably so. So for many students, that knowledge about either nutrition or how our bodies get stronger and more flexible and work and what we need to do to build that strength and flexibility and prevent injury comes from either dance as it did for me or a sport as it does for so many kids. Yeah. But you, Laura, who were not into to a sport necessarily <laughs> in high school, um, no. picked this story. And so I'm wondering, why did you pick Venus's story about Mr. Poole for today? Well, a couple of things. I just loved that it was a woman because Venus is definitely reflecting back um, from a vantage point of a woman. I loved a woman um, learning some of the things that she's going to tell us about Mr. Poole and the way he helped shape her mindset about health and fitness. Mm -hmm. And it also put me in mind as I was reading it, because I'm a woman reading how this woman now views her body and health and fitness, I was thinking about the the hundreds of millions of ladies and girls out there who are trying to look perfect, be perfect, to earn a little bit of attention because Valentine's Day is coming up. And I don't think it's probably a, as big a deal in elementary, although I, I bet the fifth graders put on a good a bit, show, a bit, yeah. um, but the middle schoolers and the high schoolers, so much pressure. And normally when I think about Valentine's day and the pressure and what, what upsets me, I'm thinking about the boys and the amount of pressure that is on them to buy the perfect gift and give all the things and do all of the things to charm and woo the girl. But Venus's story put me in mind of the girls and how much pressure is on them as well. Just maybe a little bit of a different type. Hmm. I hadn't thought about that. So with that in mind, would you, Laura, read Venus's story about Mr. Poole? I would love to. Mr. Poole was my high school physical education teacher. I was not into sports and I was not looking forward to his class, but I needed to meet my physical education requirement. I soon realized that Mr. Poole didn't see his role as teaching us how to play games. Instead, he was on a mission to help us live healthier lives. I learned so much about health and fitness from Mr. Poole. He didn't like the word diet, but he advocated for nutritious eating. He taught us that food is the fuel we need to keep our bodies going. He also wasn't a fan of extreme workouts. He helped each, each of us find an enjoyable and sustainable fitness plan. I still use the information I learned in Mr. Poole's class. Thanks to him, I developed habits that have served me well. I participated in a 5K run last year, and I saw Mr. Poole at the finish line. He was cheering on his students, present and past. I'm grateful for his continued influence. Oh, you go, Mr. Poole. Right? I, I love Poole. that. Love it. Yeah, it, uh, it makes you think as a woman how we look at exercise and eating yes and it is our goal to be as strong and healthy as possible or is our goal to be as thin <laughs> and attractive yes as possible and mm -hmm. i think as a woman who really has never been technically overweight that i've spent probably 30 years on and off of a diet mm -hmm. yep. and not always necessarily the most solid nutritious diet. I was, I felt what's, what, what's the word? I felt a little convicted reading this story again, this, this past week, um, because I 
I literally remember a conversation with a doctor. I had um, been going to the gym regularly. I think I went three or four times a week. I was doing Zumba classes and yoga classes and doing, you know, oh, there was like a kickboxing class and a contemporary dance class. Like I was moving and it didn't change my weight at all. And I remember saying to him, I haven't lost any weight doing this. I'm I'm not going to keep doing this. This is a lot. It's taking a lot of my time. Why would I do this if it's not changing my weight? And he said, do, do you not think it's changing your health? What about your health? And I said, oh, I, I have never done any of this for my health. Don't, don't be silly. And like, that was that. And that wasn't oh, 10 15 years ago. And I think I stopped going because it was doing nothing for me. I I know now what it was doing for me, Mm -hmm. but you could not have convinced me that I needed to continue that path because it didn't change anything on the scale. Oh, yes. I mean, I can relate to that. I think for me, a couple of things, I mean, turning 50. So, you know, I don't feel the same amount of pressure to be physically perfect because I'm not 20 anymore. Right. But also seeing my parents age and living in a community with so many aging people, I think my goal has changed. Like mm-hmm. I need to be mobile and flexible and yes. have some amount of endurance because I want to be the 80 year old that's still really active. Mm -hmm. So I think my motivation maybe has changed a little. Now, don't get me wrong. If the number goes up on the scale, I'm still going (laughs) to feel some kind of way. (laughs) But I don't think it's the single strong motivation that it used to be. Well, I love the idea of being strong enough that I could fall. Mm-hmm. like my athlete and not be hurt. Right. Um, Cause we're going to fall like, and not, not because we're old, but just life in life, one falls. That's what we do. Um, and I love that idea. And that goes along with yours. I want to be strong and flexible and still moving and shaking at 80. And honestly, I don't think anything has affected my idea about my body more than my foot and ankle injury that mm-hmm. I've been dealing with for the last year and a half. Yeah. So I have to have reconstructive surgery. It was canceled last summer. We're going for this summer. And so I've now spent 18 months not able to do a heck of a lot. Mm-hmm. Oh, do you want me to go to the mall? I can't go to the mall. I can't walk the mall. I can't stand in line at the grocery store for 25 minutes um, and not be almost crying. Um, I do not have a lot of physical range right now, and I haven't for 18 months. And I really feel what that has changed in me. Mm-hmm. And I'm very anxious to be able to get back at it. And I too am anxious for you <laughs> <laughs> to be back on your feet again and do all the things that I try to drag you along to do. Yeah. And that's so, I think that too is why I was so drawn to this story of Mr. Pool, not only because you and I never had a Mr. Pool. Mm-hmm. So like a whole generation of women or multiple generations, let's not be silly, um, did not have this type of instruction. Um, but we still don't have it. Like, where do you go to get a Mr. Pool who's going to guide you? So what a gift he was to that community, uh, being able to usher in probably more than one generation of students into seeing food as fuel and exercise, um, in a different way, uh, healthy and sustainable and help them choose what would be right for them. That's amazing. It's amazing. I love that as a teacher to be able to see beyond my curriculum for this year yes. and covering the standards and making sure they can pass the end of course exam and all the things. Right. He had a vision for how this content will impact their lives way into the future. Exactly. And he was focused on that. And I so admire 
that approach. Me too. Me too. I try to take that approach. Um, of course, we all are bogged down with high stakes testing at times and we maybe lose our way. But even within the confines of the high stake test, my students take um, for college credit, I am very aware that I can teach them what they need to take into life and still manage what they need to do on the test. And that's so important to me um, when kids like Venus can come back and say, you taught me how to, how to be open to this instead of telling me how to think or what to think, right? You, you just opened my mind to thinking or showed me ways to approach thinking. And that's what Mr. Poole does. And it's interesting. Nothing could be more different than literature than PE. And you can do it. If we can both do it, then I would say anyone could do it. I think it's the mindset, don't you? It's yeah. more um, thinking about what the real priorities are and the real goals are and not letting someone else who is determining policy yes. or um, creating a value added measure or whatever other kind of silliness don't get me started <laughs> on the reliability of a value added measure because no one wants to hear me go on that rant today right, it's right and we all we are with you we are all with you but it is it's some amount of courage that he had to say yes. i will balance the pressure to have these high end of course exams and demonstrate mastery of these standards with what I know is important to kids long term because I love them and I want them to be healthy and well. Yes. Yeah. Go, Mr. Poole. Exactly. Fight the good fight, Mr. <laughs> Poole. <laughs> yes. And we need that and our kids need it. And more than need it, they deserve it. Mm. Um they they deserve more than policy and standards and uh, benchmark tests are giving them. So as we go into this week, let's think about our why, because clearly he had a powerful why and a sense of purpose that went beyond the year they spent or the semester they spent with him in the classroom. So let's all this week think about our why and not get distracted or bogged down with the measures of things so much so that the measure becomes the thing and overtakes our why. Yes. Okay. I am That's so in this. I am in it, Julie. <laughs> in it. Her competitive side. <laughs> I, I will not run, but I will get a hard why. <laughs> <laughs> and it's to win it. My why will be the strongest why. Yes, exactly. Has ever why. <laughs> yes. Yes. I am very competitive. So you have ignited me. Thank you. Nice. If I have accomplished nothing else over the course of this <laughs> half hour, I have ignited your why and I'll take it. And if you've ignited mine, it. you've ignited someone else's. So I we're all going to get on our whys. So friends, we hope we have ignited your why, <laughs> made you courageous, made you think long term about the impact you have on your students lives if you loved venus's story about mr pool remember this story and all the stories on the pod are in the lessons that last book this one is lesson 51 titled lasting influence yes so thank you thank you for coming and spending a little bit of time with us this week have a great week teacher friends Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you will subscribe to the Lessons That Last podcast wherever you listen. Give us a rating too, which will help other listeners find us. And don't forget to visit chalkandchances.com for more stories. You can also find more information on Julie's research in books. While you're there, take the quiz to find out what kind of memorable teacher you are. I took it and was surprised by what I found. I think you'll find good food for thought. Let us know about your quiz results. We hope you will meet us here each week and bring a friend to share the conversation.